decided we'd try it again. You know, we tried it again, and we keep doing it every year. And each year, uh, we have an opportunity to reach people. And it's not to me about how many people show up. It's just how many people are touched. Amen. We just want people to be touched to the Lord. And, uh, you know, I love the, uh, the gearhead community. I love the biker community. Uh, cowboys, you know, we're not a cowboy church. We're a church that loves cowboys. We actually started cleaning the arena again. I was picking on Joseph. He needed to get his daughter a horse. Amen. He said no. Amen. So we'll just see how it goes. I just, I just love horses. I just got tired of getting thrown off. Amen. Got your Bibles open to the book of Mark, chapter 10, verse 29. Mark, chapter 10, verse 29. Matthew, Mark, verse 10. H Hannah, thanks for taking notes. Amen. I appreciate those that take notes because you're going to need these as life moves on. Over the next few weeks, I'm going to preach a series on no pain, no gain. Everybody say no pain, no gain. Why is that important? Because I found out in life, a little rain must fall. A little rain must fall. And uh, this message is uh, it's one that's been tempered over the last few days. I found myself in tears this morning when I woke up thinking about, you know, I was, I was kind of had a hard nose about some things, and then I softened up as the, the hurricane moved in, and I had remembrance of things that we had lost uh, times, and, you know, I couldn't change it. The flood came in, took away most of the stuff in my home, and then Imelda came two years later, did the same thing. So as I walk through this, it's not about me, it's about us and what we've gone through in life. And, and there's times, just, there's no other way to say it. life is hard because we live in a fallen world. Nothing works the way it's supposed to. It just don't work the way it's supposed to. So, you know, sin has stained every part of the physical universe, and it's deeply infected our bloodstream. Amen. If things break, the bodies wear out, we grow old, and we pass. People still kill each other, hurt each other. You know, we hurt each other. And it goes on. And, and so into each life, we understand that we're face-to-face -face with a reality that believers would rather not talk about. I, I remember when I first got born again, it was like, hey, if you get saved, everything's going to be good. And I found out that everything works for the good to them that love God, but not everything's good. Hey, man, things happen. Are you comfortable? So I don't want to be misunderstood this morning, but I will tell you that the best life there is is life in Christ. Amen. If you've got a life in Jesus, it's the best life there is. Because within that, there are some answers. We don't get all the answers, but there are some answers. And Jesus told us in Mark chapter 10, verse 29, Truly I tell you, he replied, No one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields. Watch this, these three words along with persecution. See, a lot of times people say, man, I wish I had a lot of stuff. Did you know with a lot of stuff comes a lot of problems? Amen. And then there are persecutions. And in this age to come, eternal life. So the great thing for us is to understand we have eternal life next. Now, when I first read this 40 years ago, I thought, now that ain't true. And now the longer I've served God, I realize I have more mothers and I have more fathers. Amen. I have both brothers and sisters. Even God just began to multiply that which I let go of back in the day. Amen. He keeps blessing me with it. So this verse has come true. But the issue of persecution deals with trials and troubles. The message today is the struggle is real. Everybody say the struggle is real. It's the bottom line. It, it, it's real. Some of you, I was telling my pastor in a way, him, here, I, get, I struggle over this virus and the pandemic and shutting down. But on the other hand, when a friend or, or somebody I love dies and, and they had the virus, my heart is broken. Amen. My wife looked at me this week and she said, I, I can't believe you haven't been sick. For two, for two years, I've not been sick. Amen. I've, not had, I've had a little sign, and I'm not boasting. I'm just telling you. Uh, and, and, you know, my, my staff can tell you the same thing. I've just kept right on going. I've hugged. I've greeted. I've, I've just been me. And in so doing, I feel like there has been a protection. But on the flip side, I hurt for other people. Amen. I sympathize with them. I, I, uh, I grieve with them. I have a funeral coming this week. I've got another funeral coming the next week. Amen. Life had to slow down. Amen. People are still entering the earth, and people are still leaving the earth. It's what we do here that matters. Can I get an amen? Father, I thank you for the word of God. I ask that you anoint my lips to share it, our hearts to hear and receive. In the next few minutes, give us revelation. Let the light come on. Break us free from the bondages that held us back. Help us live a life full of 
of purpose, Lord, and moving toward our destiny. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. you. May be seated. If there's ever been a time I stood in the pulpit and I felt like I had an appointment, it was today. You know, I just, I just know that when you follow Christ, you have to lose your life in order to save it. He says that over and over. Amen. And Romans chapter 7 speaks of a war going on in our inner life as believers. In Romans 8, 13, it commands us to put to death the deeds of the flesh. Galatians 5, 17 tells us that the flesh and the spirit are continually at war. Have you found out you always got a fight on the inside? There's always a fight, and it's always these three things. It's the world, it's the flesh, and the devil. Not everything's the devil, not everything's the world, not everything's the flesh. But everything is the flesh, everything is the world, and everything is the devil. Amen. So when I look around, the world is out there. That's we fighting against the world, and it's all around us. The flesh is inside of us and loves to answer the call of the world. And it seems like the devil is everywhere, like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Again, there is no growth without struggle. As I talked to my pastor this morning, we, we talked about the butterfly coming out of the cocoon. We talked about the chick coming out of the egg. We understand even nature is screaming that without a struggle, amen, you're not going to grow. you got to go through it. Acts chapter 14 verse 22 says, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, 3, share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. We sang a song this morning, uh, Amazing Grace. Through many, through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. His grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. Amen. That life is full of dangers and toils and snares. And because of that, along this road, there leads to, there leads to, uh, to heaven. Spiritual growth is possible. Amen. And it, but it's not instant. There has to be um, an understanding there will be struggle. So I'm going to throw some things at you very quickly. Here's some principles. Because we live in a fallen world, bad things happen to all of us. They happen to all of us. Amen. It rains on the just and the unjust. Second, we have no control over many things that happen to us or to those around us. James, we have no control over many things that happen to us or to those around us. James had a, had a motorcycle and trade, uh, sold it, got him a brand new one. Amen. Had 13 miles on it and was rear-ended right here in front of Walmart. 13 miles, not even a day old. Amen. A drunk driver hit him and then left the scene. They caught the drunk but destroyed his body. Hey, look at you. You're sitting here with your wife and kids. It's an amazing thing when I see that. We have no control over many things that happen to us or to those around us. We do not have complete control over how, excuse me, we do have complete control over how we, we, we respond. And this is what I find biblically in my life. It's how I respond to the things that I've gone through in life. And when I hit these places, when the struggle hits, and our response to our trials largely determines our spiritual growth or lack thereof. How do I handle this trial? How do I deal with it? Struggle in this life is inevitable, lifelong and ultimately beneficial. So we we encounter God's grace through our trials in many ways. Listen, it takes mature believers to understand there is no growth without struggle. Ironically, it is the struggle that makes us grow. Got to have a struggle. Amen. It's going to make us grow. So I'm going to teach you a couple of things and walk you through it. First, be a student, not a victim. Everybody say it with me. Be a student, not a victim. Pastor, I'm already out of school. No, you're not. You're still in school. Amen. Everybody here, but pal, I'm 80 year old. You still in school. You still got some things to learn. Be a student, not a victim. Amen. A victim says, why did this happen to me? A student says, I don't care why it happened. I want to learn what God is trying to teach me. Amen. What am I going to learn through what I'm going through right now? Second thing, a victim looks at everyone else and cries out, life ain't fair. A student looks at life and says, what happened to me could have happened to anybody. James, what happened to you could have happened to anybody. It ain't just because you're a good-looking believer in Christ. Amen. That ain't the reason why it happened. It ain't because you were driving a Honda. That ain't why it happened. Amen. Why, why, why did it happen? It could happen to anybody. Amen. Anybody could get sick. Anybody could go through troubles in life. Anybody could lose a spouse. Anybody, and probably will as we move through life. Amen. It just happens. A victim feels sorry for himself that he has no time for others. A student focuses on helping others so that he has no time to feel sorry for himself. Amen. I can sit here and feel sorry for Now, I'm going to get on this in a minute. I'm fixing to say some things that are really hard for me to say, but I believe necessary. You ever gone to the doctor and he says some hard things to you and you realize you didn't like what he said, but it was necessary and you wrote him a check anyway? Well, get ready to write a check because I'm going to say some things to you, all right? Amen. A victim begs God to remove the problems of life so that he might be happy. A student 
has learned through the problems of life that God alone is his source of all true happiness. Amen. In other words, when I'm going through hard times, I realize that God is my source. And a lot of times I can't trust my feelings. James chapter 1 verse 2 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many, ty- many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance or patience. Let patience, perseverance, finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. I like being around people, period. But there's something about people that are mature, people that have gone through life and ain't whining about it, that I really like being around. Because they've learned how to handle life. And that's what James is saying here. So the command, there's a command here, the reason and the promise. The command, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. James begins to remind us that sooner or later, probably sooner, we're all going to face trials of various sorts. You know, this pandemic has been a trial. For right now, Louisiana, the Ida has become a trial. Many of us have already gone through trials like this, but it's going to happen. The word face has the idea of falling or stumbling over a problem. So I want you to picture someone driving down the highway, not a problem in the world, radios playing, not a care or concern. Suddenly, there's a bump, there's a jolt, and the truck, sudden halt. What happened? Rear-ended by a young man in a Camry eating, and suddenly the journey is over. My face has fallen. That happened to me this week. I mean, nothing was going on. And all of a sudden... Bam! I get hit from behind. My head snaps back. I look back, and there's somebody sitting back. I get out of my truck. It's like, it's, again, the Scripture says here, when you face, face trials, amen, when, whenever you face trials of many kinds, that, it says that joke, James, that you got thrown off, hit. Mine wasn't near as severe as yours. Mine was a really good story till I read yours. I get out, I look, and here's a, here's a hole poked in the guy, the Camry, amen, right into his bumper. I look and realize what a great thing to drive a truck and make sure you always keep your hitch on, amen, amen. It just deals with, I looked at him and said, you on your phone? He said, no, sir, I was eating. I said, I smiled at him and said, oh, God, I love you. How then should we respond to these hard times that suddenly come to us? James offers us some thoughts here. He says, consider it pure joy. And I got to add this. Are you nuts? Are you crazy? Amen. How do we as humans consider it pure joy? The word joy is simply the word joy. It's what it means to be be very glad. Another says consider yourself fortunate when you go through trials. The J.B. Phillips says when all kinds of trials and temptations crowd into your lives, my brothers, don't resent them as intruders, but welcome them as friends, exclamation point. Welcome them like a friend that came because something's fixing to happen. And here's the thing. You can have a natural response to things that happen in life and struggle, or you can have a supernatural response. It's that difference. You know, I always hear when David's up here praying, he'd say, God put the super on my natural. And when you think of that, understand this. When you're going through trials of all kinds of struggles in life, that it's important to have that. a natural response. You can talk about that. I can see that on social media. It's anger. It's despair. It's complaining. It's getting even or it's running away. That's what I always see. Anger, despair, complaining, getting even, or running away when the problem happens. Amen. That's natural. But supernatural reaction, amen, is when the Spirit of God moves on your life, and you're able to respond to something with God's point of view. The hardest thing is to get yourself vertical and look back down and say, okay, God, what is it you're showing me? What is your point of view in this thing? What we see is not the final chapter of the story. It ain't the end of anything. Thank God there's an eternity on the other side that's going to answer a lot of our questions. But on this side, I don't see it. It's not the final chapter, so i got to keep moving forward. If we can make the choice to view life that way, then we can make the following statements. First, this is sent from the Lord. You've heard me say this for years. If it's not God sent, it can be God used. If God didn't send it, then God can use it. So i got to ask myself, did God send this this way? Second, this is necessary for my spiritual growth. God wants you to grow physically. We know that. Amen. From the time the baby is, is whining and crying, and we give milk and then food, and we grow the child up, and, and we hear the kid in the back seat going, I'm hungry. And we went through a McDonald's. All that is to help feed them, to grow them up. But then our spiritual man inside of us, and I've said this for years, that our spiritual man inside of us is going, help me. Help me. I'm struggling. And every time you go through a problem or trial, you forget that God's trying to grow your spiritual man inside of you, but instead you suppress it and act like you you start to get feeling sorry for yourself. Things begin to happen in your life. Amen. And you forget to count it all joy. Amen. Smile at me, please. 
Thank you. That just helps when I'm preaching here. So joy is a deep satisfaction that comes from knowing that God is in control. I got to say, God, you are in control of everything, every circumstance. Amen. It's not out of, it may be out of my control, but it's not out of your control here. So I got to cons consider it joy. You know, we went through the hurricane. We went through a, a Harvey, went through a Melda. And I look back over and I realize I, I have a nicer home now than I had before. Wow. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. That we've gone through the, because now something's even a little bit better. Amen. The hurricanes is why, why you even got a job, Charlie. Yeah, I know. Amen. So, so God had, had blessed over and over again. Amen. You, you have to just look at it and back off and say, okay, I can count this joy. During the funeral of a friend of mine last uh, two weeks ago, many of you know I was out of town for, for a season, uh, for, for actually eight days, not a season, eight felt like a season, 3,700 miles. Riding scooters and pulling scooters and whatever to get where we were getting my daughter to college, to see my other daughter and son, yacht, yacht, yacht. But I went to preach the funeral. While I was there, the Lord reminded me of David and his situation. David, his little baby, had died from Bathsheba or was dying. And David, for two weeks, threw ashes on himself and he prayed. He was in the trial of his life. When I read the words, count it all joy, I can't find count it all joy here but I see it because in this situation, David overheard the whispers of his servants about the child dying. When they replied that the child had died, the scripture says that David rose, washed, and anointed himself, and he put on fresh clothes, and he went to the church, and he worshiped. Later, he returned to his house, and he began to eat a meal. The puzzled servants couldn't figure out why he fasted and wept when the child was alive, but when he died, he got up, went to the temple, and ate. David's response is classic, verse 22, chapter 12, 2 Samuel. David answered, as long as the child was alive and fasted, I cried. I thought, who knows, the Lord may be gracious to me and let him live. But why should I fast now that he's gone? Can I bring him back? Someday I'll go to him, but he won't come back to me. When I read this response, this Old Testament response, this response of this warrior, David, when he makes this statement about this child, I don't see count it all joy. I don't hear it, but I see it. Because he's saying right now, I can't change the past. I can't make him come. And what this does, it keeps us from bitterness. I've used this phrase a lot, believe God for the best, accept the verdict. And that's what David did. He believed God for the best, and then he accepted the verdict. I see joy there in his life. Amen. David's response teaches us that deep down, far deeper than his sin, he understood God. He understood that even though his, through his tears, life has to go on. He could not and should not fast and pray and weep forever. You know what he did do? He got back with Bathsheba, and they had a son. His name is Solomon. Amen. He went on in life. So this is a hard statement I will make to you. Part of the hardest I'll make in a while. Sorrow can be selfish. It can be absolutely selfish. Amen. When I read about it, I understand that Scripture says in Isaiah 53, 3, that Jesus was acquainted with sorrow and grief. He's despised and rejected of man, uh, of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He did not, the Scripture says, hide himself, uh, amen, from it. He was despised. He was esteemed. I read these statements, and not, they're not on the overhead. Don't, don't search for it, Mike. I, these are things I added later. But I realized he was acquainted with grief and sorrow. If I'm acquainted with you, it means I really don't know you. I've shook your hand. You know, when, when the guy came back from New Orleans, I, I, I was acquainted with him, but I didn't really know him. And, and then he told me, he said, my daughter got in touch with you. It's an acquaintance. So Jesus is acquainted with sorrow, but he didn't allow sorrow to become his friend. He didn't allow himself to stay in sorrow. And what happens in life, I, I, I read here, he said, blessed are those who, are, who mourn, they shall be comforted. It's okay to mourn. You're going to get comforted, sorrow for a little while. He, he's, uh, when they came to Jesus and said, John the Baptist is in jail, he's going to be beheaded. He said, you know, okay, that's good. I'm not going to go see him. But blessed are he that's not offended with me. In other words, when you serve this biblical, this, this kingdom lifestyle, you're going to have some sorrow in life, but don't allow it to own you. Don't allow it to, to stay with you because the bottom line is you can become mm, selfish with it. This preacher by the, by the name of Alexander McLaren said this, there are many of us who make some disappointment, some loss, some grief, the excuse from shirking plain duty or work. There is nothing more selfish than sorrow, and there is nothing more absorbing unless we guard against this tendency 
to monopolize. Hold that right there. Let me say it again. Many of us who make some disappointment, some loss, some grief, the excuse for, for shirking or walking away from work, there is nothing more selfish than sorrow. There's nothing more absorbing unless we guard against his tendency to monopolize. Sorrow can monopolize your time, amen, your energy. Sorrow will take over your joy, amen. It will remove love from your life. Sorrow, you get in it. I see it so many times. I watch it. Somebody passed away, and years later, that's all the people keep talking about, or they went through a divorce. That's all they keep talking about, the loss of a career. That's all they keep talking about, and they live in the sorrow, and they never reengage in life. They never get back involved. They allow the same. As a matter of fact, the problem is I've gone through sorrow, and their sorrow always tries to override or monopolize anything. You, you forgot to be sorry with me. You forgot to feel for me. Amen, because you won't let go of something that happened to you years ago. Amen, so what's important? How do I do it? Pastor, what do I do? McLaren goes on to say work. Work for others. Work for God. It's our best comforter. Amen. Next to the promise of God's Spirit being there with us, there's nothing that so lightens the weight of a lifelong sorrow as to make it the stimulus to a lifelong devotion. Amen. What you've gone through, you need to make a, a, a devotion toward God. And if our patience has its perfect work, it will not make us sit with folded hands, weeping for the days that are no more, but it will drive us into heroic and energetic service in the midst of which there will come some shadow of consolation, or at least some blessed oblivion of sorrow. In other words, if I can keep moving through life, if I can go on, if I can remind myself of the promises of God, if I can give thanks for what you can give thanks for, even if it's the small things, if you can refuse to give into bitterness and despair like David is, if you can choose to believe in God, if you can make up your mind to go on with life, you won't live in sorrow. But I'm just going to tell you, I, I've experienced it in my own life. I've lost great things. I've lost great people. I have, I've, I've allowed myself to wallow for just a little while. But the only thing that saved me was you. Was you. You became my purpose. All of a sudden, my work kicked back in. I started being motivated again to get back into life because had I not, I would have wallowed in it and died in it. Oh, come on, preach. That's what David did. That's what David did. He got up, he washed himself. I know many of your stories. I know the passing of some of your children, some of your parents. Amen. I know the devastation of things you've lost in life. Amen. And many of you have decided, you know, I'm not going to say that way, but these, there's some pews in here that are empty from people who decided that sorrow was greater than their Savior. And they stayed home with it, and they wallow in it, and they demand you to pay attention to it. And if not, you're not going to be their friend no more. I told you, you can write my check later. You can't live in yesterday. The voice of God calls us onward toward tomorrow. He, lets, he, he just stays with us. He said, I want you to be a student and not a victim. Amen. So the struggle is real. God's call is always onward, forward, moving out by faith into an unknown future. I can't go back. I can't stay here. I have to go forward. Refuse to let sorrow own you. Get back to work. Get back into production. You know, Miss Jeanette, I look at you, and I remind myself that when Jimmy passed, your husband, who we loved, and I've seen what God, I've seen the sorrows you've gone through, sis. And then you keep painting pictures and you stay at it. If I paint, it's got to be by numbers. And even that, I can't stay in the line. But my house is adorned with paintings that you've done. Amen. Because you refuse to give up. Miss Dolly still cuts my hair. Amen. But when Mr. Gant passed away, I prayed for you, Miss Dolly. I didn't know what would happen because he'd be so much your purpose. Amen. In life. But she never quit. She grabbed her scissors and her shears, and she went right back to work. Amen. Thank God for that. Hallelujah. Amen. What's the reason? James 1.3 says, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. So when my, my faith is tested, amen, something is coming out of here that's different than book learning. I can't learn this in no college. I've got to walk through something here. The word testing refers to the process by which gold or ore is purified. In order to separate gold from the dross, the ore has to be placed in a furnace. It's heated until it's melted. The dross rises to the top. It's scraped away. It's what the Scripture talks about, fiery furnace. Job 23.10. He knows the way I take when he has tested me, the forged Joseph, I will come forth as gold after he tested me. So this is the testing of our faith. Amen. We go through things in life in order to make us better. I said the struggle is real. Can I get an amen? Amen. You can talk about heaven all you want, but you'll discover whether or not you really believe in it when you stand by the casket of someone you love. 
Amen. It's the testing of your faith. The word perseverance, I remember learning it way back in college. It's the word hupomony, hupomony, I've always called it. Amen. It literally means patience. It's the ability to endure, that God puts us through tests to see if we'll endure. And it's funny how I, it's one of the first things I remember learning in college, that, 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 uh, that Greek word, because it seemed like my whole life has been one of endurance, one pressing on, one understanding without pain. There's no gain. Amen. I've got to move on to it. The martyrs gained. When I say, you know, martyr, a martyr is what the Christians in Afghanistan right now that are being killed are called. Amen. Somebody who stands for their faith who will not bow down. The martyrs of the early church gained the respect of unbelievers because in the moment of death, they had this quality to the very end. They died with their faith intact. Amen. Of them, it was said, they died singing. Martin Luther said they died well. Amen. We live well. We've got to learn how to die well. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, let me start closing here. The promise. Somebody said amen. James 1, 4. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So what I am going through removes lack out of my life. Amen. It matures me and it grows me up. There has to be a day. When we have to quit parting the beards of men in order to put a milk bottle in, spiritually speaking. Amen. And we grow up and decide, you know what, okay, it's time to eat some meat here. Hallelujah. There's a process involved in our trials that lead to, to a product. Perseverance requires work, faith, hope, dog determination. Amen. To hold on to our faith even when the world seems to be disintegrating around us. The great danger is that we'll try to short circuit the process. You remember what, what Satan told Jesus when he was hungry after 40 days of fasting? I know some of you fast at least a week, two weeks. Have you gone a day without eating lately? Me neither. I'm just asking you if you have. Amen. But I can tell you it's difficult. I have gone three, four days. Amen. Now you can go a long time without eating, but you can't go a long time without drinking. I mean, you got to keep drinking. You got to have something to drink water I'm talking about and in so doing when Satan came to Jesus he said cast this you can cast, make this stone into bread and get you something to eat and Jesus said uh, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God what Satan was trying to get Jesus to do was shortcut process to shortcut process means that, that the ground has to be tilled the seed has to go in you got to give it time and then you get harvest after you water it. Then you take the wheat and you beat it out into fine flour. And then you make it into a bread. And you put it into an oven and you give it heat and bread. What Satan said is, I know who you are. You're God. And if you wanted to, you could turn this stone into bread. And Jesus being hungry, he already knew that. Jesus could have looked at a mountain and called it a um, Pillsbury. You know, he could, just, he, could, he could have brought fish up. He, he decided for 40 days of fasting that he was going to seek the Father. And then the temptation came. The trials came. He said, no, I'm not going to shortcut process. Some of you have gone through <sighs> hell on earth. And there's no shortcut in the process that made you the man and the woman of God that you are. Amen. And that process will continue until Jesus comes. Amen. So don't try to get out of it anything prematurely so things that i know and things that i don't know first we can't always understand why things happen the way they do no matter how hard we try to figure things out and here's what i realized the greater the tragedy the greater will be the mystery that god doesn't always tell us why and people ask why, and they try to bargain with god about things and he doesn't always tell us amen now, there's going to be un filled blanks all the way to heaven second when hard times come we can know that god is at work in our trials for our benefit and for his glory somehow this is going to work out for good romans 8 you know it we know that in all things god works for the good to those who love him who've been called according to his purpose so he's going to work it out for my good there is no growth without struggle amen so i'm going to leave you with a couple of simple words first pray and stay Pray and stay. Pray and stay. Pray and stay. Pray. See God's face. Spend time with it. Not just on Tuesday night, but every night. 
Spend some time with him. Amen. Listen for his voice. Ask God, what are, you, what are you trying to teach me right now? Speak, Lord. I'm listening to your voice. And then second, stay. Wait. Be patient. Don't rush God. You can't rush God. How are you going to rush God? You're going to grab God by the nap of his neck and make him do something? It, it ain't going to happen. So the choice is ours. Joy or bitterness, forgiveness or anger, trust or unbelief, faith or fear, love or hatred, kindness or malice, gentleness or stubbornness, mercy or revenge, peace or worry, hope or despair. you got a choice. Make the right choice. Go back to that slide, bro, man, because the struggle's real. And your choice is going to change everything. How you handle this moment. Amen. As you walk through it. So our perspective makes all the difference. Our trials are not sent to make us fall. God never sent a trial, never sent a test your way to watch you struggle or fall. That was never his intention. His intention, amen, was to see us grow and become mature and to count it all joy as we're going through it. Amen. Be a student, not a victim. What I learned. What did I learn? Maybe you got to write it down. You know, I write so many things down. I, I, yeah, I use an iPad, and I have a place in there I can write notes. But when I look in any of my old Bibles, I look toward the back, and I realize I wrote down stuff. Don't you love having an old Bible and finding it and realizing you wrote things in it? Amen. It reminds you of what you've gone through in life. You need to write down the date you was hit from behind, James, by a drunk driver. Because just two weeks before that, I preached a funeral of my friend who did this, went through the same thing. And you survived. I've also been down on that road on my bike, and I survived. I don't always know the whys. Don't, 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 I don't. All I know is who. Who watching over me? Who sends angels my way? Who that while on this earth I have made up my mind, God, you sent me, and you will not exit at me until you're done with me. So I'm going to stand believing that promise for me and those that I pastor. Father, I ask you in the name of Jesus for us to not allow sorrow to monopolize our lives. I speak to your people. I rebuke sorrow. The, the, the sorrow that has kept them into a place of doldrums and darkness. That's excommunicated me from their life because of sorrow. They've divorced other people from their life because they refuse to come out of sorrow. God, let you mean more to us than any father, mother, brother, sister, house, or thing in this earth. That what matters to us is you. And that if we give up father, mother, brother, sister, homes in this life, you got more in the life to come. So, God, let our love be you. Let our passion be after you. Let us take up our cross daily and follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I, I don't know about you, but sometimes I'll preach something like that and I go, Boy, I'm glad I got that out of the way. Because <laughs> my heart breaks for people who've allowed sorrow to own them. You become selfish with it. Amen. For those who think themselves a victim, last week I preached on victim mentalities. Amen. Don't life. Don't let life allow you to be a victim. Be a student. Keep right on growing. Who knows? So you say, well, I've never had a degree. You're going to get one. Amen. You're going to get a degree if you keep growing in this life. Amen. If you need to tithe or offer an envelope, that check I was telling you about, right? It's right in front of you. Right now, grab that tithe or offer. If you give it by phone, you can go to holywild.net slash give. Amen. Those online, I thank you for giving. We're seeing more and more using our online services. We thank God for that. Matter of fact, that's how they reconnected with us to come back out to the ranch. And I want you to pray that we have wisdom as the storm moves on. I told my wife last night, I said, uh, baby, I, there's a chance that many of us might be leaving Texas to go to Louisiana. Amen. I've been in touch with Kenneth and Ken and other people that we know in Louisiana. I know other pastors there. Yeah, I, first off, I'm a thankful man that it hadn't hit us. Amen. But I still struggle for my friends there. Amen. Amen. So if you're, where's our servant leaders at? Amen. I mentioned something. Nobody moved. <laughs> I, I must be getting dull. <laughs> Amen. 
some quick announcements here as they're getting ready. Everybody got your offering ready. Hopefully you made it before you got here. As we give today, we're believing God for jobs and better jobs. More money, less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor and success to the kingdom of God. Don't forget Tuesday night prayer meeting. I hear such great testimonies about Tuesday night. Tuesday night, 7 o'clock here. Amen. Two or more. Hallelujah. Of course, church merch, you know about, about that. I just got me a Holy Wild hat, so uh, they got some cool stuff on there that you can pick up. Amen. September 7th and 8th will be our first week midweek. So not this week, but the week after. Of course, I'll be preaching on No Pain, No Gain. We'll